Bert Allen here. Thanks for listening today and being a part of our conversation. Uh, we are chatting with actress Julianne Emery from, well, we're talking about Five Days of Memorial, but also so many other great projects, including a recent one that sadly ended, uh, Better Call Saul. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we're here to talk about Five Days here first. Uh, thanks so much for your time and for hanging out today. I appreciate it. Oh, uh, Thanks so much for having me. Yes. Well, we had several of your cast members on from five days uh, during your press run. And uh, I tell you, it was just such a great show all around, really. And the cast, we had Robert Pine and we had a bunch of other people. So I'm very curious because I this is a story that obviously was based on true events um, and uh, had sort of had gone into history past and then your creators and your writers came up with this anthology series for Apple uh, to tell the story again. What interested you in the project initially uh, and kind of pushed you in the direction of doing this? Well, if you haven't at minimum read Sherry Fink's Pulitzer Prize winning article that broke the story wide open, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a, not a long read, but her book, um, is exhaustive and brilliant and uh it really goes it really takes you inside the hospital during those five days and it's um i thought when i sat down to read it i thought it might be very dry but it's actually incredibly narrative and beautiful but that aside that just the names john ridley and carlton cues on a piece of paper together it was enough to make me interested right i've wanted to work with either of them in some way i'm a big fan of what they do and then when i uh, got the script, um, Vera for me and Terry Jones were already attached. So it's just the, the caliber of creatives involved was very high. Um, Apple TV plus, uh, was so, um, dedicated to our creatives, to John and Carlton's creative vision. And they really gave us the resources to make it happen in a big giant way on screen. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I had read the book a while ago and then when I heard, that there was going to be a televised version of it. It was in very emphatic stage. They hadn't even decided where it was going to go yet, but you know how it is in this business. Yeah. Like, Hey, we're, this show is in production. We're talking about doing it via Fumaris interested. And then it just kind of unfolded from there. If you're listening and you haven't seen this yet, I highly recommend it. Um, Apple TV, Apple TV plus is an easy get. And this is a fantastic watch. Um, you said something interesting that I want to talk about when as an actor, you get to do a lot of great projects, but I, what I find so interesting about your world, because you've been in so many great things, the fact that you, this is going to sound strange, but you get very excited to work with some of these massive people. I mean, it has to be like a thrill, uh, you know, like each time you come on to a new project and go, Oh my gosh, I'm going to be working with some of the biggest names in the industry. I mean, does, does it ever hit you? Like you're, you're like, Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm actually working with these people or is it just surreal the entire time? So, so it hits, it hits me initially, like my agent calls, he's like, you got this. And I'm like, no way, no way. Right. <laughs> like, like um, when I, when I, when I booked better call Saul, uh, I had done season one of Fargo with Bob Odenkirk. And I was yeah. really excited about that. But I was like, and Vince, you know, Peter Gould wrote the first episode and Vince Gilligan directed it. And we had extra time to shoot it. And I actually said to my agents, I was like, this is like a creative dream come true to go from Fargo to this. And um, past that initial stage, I, you know, I go down massive rabbit holes with my characters and, and I, I, uh, I dig into my work so that I can try to live up to the people around me um, as best I possibly, possibly can. And uh, I think that obsessiveness about building character and serving the story and figure out figuring out where I serve the story um, makes me able to show up on set instead of to just fangirl on everybody. Right. Like it's, <laughs> um, um, because I am I am a massive fan of of Carlton and and of John's and of Vince Gilligan's and Peter's. And I mean, Noah Hawley is brilliant. I mean, I have had the great good fortune. Uh, Grant Hesloff and George Clooney were my directors for Cash 22. In addition to George being, you know, uh, me playing George's wife. Like it's, um, I think at some point it has to get down to the work, but that initial, um, 
that initial phone call, my, my agents and my lawyer both say that I'm the best person to get good news to like, so I, so I always do my little happy dance in that initial phone call. And then I dig into the work as quickly as possible. Yeah. I, I would imagine it like, obviously there's professionalism and decorum and things, yeah. but I mean, if you've worked with Bob before, you know, it's kind of like, you know, him. And so it's like, Hey, that's just great. We get to work together again. But when you come on to like a massive project like this one, um, I mean, I don't know how I would respond. I, I did some stand in as a sidebar in background work in New Mexico on Breaking Bad, the first oh, round. Oh, nice. Isn't it the nicest crew ever? It is unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's really wonderful. And people working at the highest levels that are just lovely human beings. Yes. And with the types of characters that they write, um, I got you just look at them and you go, these are professional actors, but highly believable as yeah. a drug dealer. <laughs> it's just put it kindly um, or whatever the case might be. Um, so overall five days is, it is such a great show. Um, are there any moments from this that you did just kind of stand out to you uh, when you got a chance to film it, the character that you play um, as far as like, getting to getting to work as you say in the story that just kind of stand out to you as hallmark moments as an actor that you go this is great to put in my encyclopedia as a storyteller that i can sort of reference again you know maybe not the same character but maybe notes or, or just moments that are very special uh because this is such a huge undertaking of a project i think there are things that change how you work okay and I think there are also things that sometimes change how you look at the world. And five days as a whole has changed how I look at the world. I mean, if nothing else, what we're creeping up on voting right now, and if nothing else, it's a, it's a uh, an astounding example of how much your local, state, and federal government matter um, in all moments of your life, right? Yeah. So don't ignore that. Don't ignore your local elections. Don't ignore the people who are supposed to show up for you when something like this happens. Um, and then there are moments, uh, John Ridley, uh, you know, we, we, we shot, uh, the bulk of it in Toronto, the interiors, and then we shot for exteriors for a month in new Orleans. And, at our so we it was a moment when we still were having to quarantine for two weeks when we entered Canada. The borders were still closed. It was very strict, and uh, so we had our first sets of uh, cast meetings and table reads over Zoom. And at the very first Zoom, John Ridley uh, said two things that I think will impact me forever. He 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 said a variation on a Mark Twain quote: um, "History doesn't repeat itself, but but it does rhyme." Yes. and that just hit me like a ton of bricks. And uh, I think we've seen that a lot um, of late. And we're gonna we just saw Hurricane Ian in Florida. We've seen this continue to rhyme over and over again, and we're not getting that much better at it. Uh, I think there were people stuck in a hospital in uh, Florida for four days, but they did keep power. So power means life, right? So. Uh, the other thing he said is that he was, he and Carlton were very determined to, for our work environment, to the set, to be a place of kindness and respect. And he called on the main cast to be ambassadors of that um, and be leaders in that way. And this was, uh, I, I mean, the best work environment I've ever been in. And, and it, shows up on screen in a million different ways. And it's not something Hollywood puts a do an added dollar value on and they should. Like when you don't have to protect yourself off screen, um, you don't have to tear down those walls to get to the emotional work on screen. And yeah. it just kind of everything just kind of falls, flows and falls right into place. And that that's a, that's a little hoodoo -y way to talk about it, but it's um, it's it really does make a massive difference on where you're able to get to in the scenes. And in this story, particularly, you know, my character, uh, I run Life Care, which is a long term care facility on the seventh floor of the hospital. We rent that floor from a healthcare conglomerate called Tenant. And that becomes life and death by the end of it. Like this is a massive indictment of corporate healthcare, but it's, you know, it's, um, I, I think, uh, I, I think that level, it, my side of the story carries the emotional consequences for the yeah. audience, right? Like we're the place where the audience is really supposed to connect. 
really supposed to uh, lean in and really supposed to feel the consequences of what happened. And we were very dedicated to making that happen and going as deep as possible. So when you don't have to protect yourself off camera, you can go much, much deeper on camera. There's a scene in episode five with my, my beautiful, sweet friend, Damon Standifer. Um, I don't want to spoiler it if people haven't seen it, but I don't, I, I don't think I've ever been that emotionally naked on, on, on screen. John Ridley directed it so beautifully. Ramsey Nichols shot it so beautifully. Um, but it felt like we were just there together. And it's, I think some of that is Matthew Davies' brilliant set. Some of that is John's brilliant direction and brilliant writing. And some of that is that we weren't having to protect ourselves and be something else off screen. Part of that was just work environment. And I think Better Call Saul and the Breaking Bad world have a similar beautiful work environment and you see yeah. a higher level of work happening. So I, I, I hope not just in my business, but in all businesses, we can really take a look at work environment and how that affects our output and what we've got. Yeah. And as we wrap here, one of the things that I, I really appreciated about it is how you told the story. Uh, and in the same vein, you know, oftentimes news wise, political wise, the way that we get presented stories, uh, yeah. depending on where you're going for your news uh, and people listening and will be watching the audio version. I don't talk politically a lot, but this really was a great way to tell a story instead of it making look like. A bunch well, there of were, were if you're, I mean, up. look, you don't have to talk politics. People fell down on all sides of politics. In this, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, no, so no, it's you're not, right. This is equal opportunity here. This is every yeah. leadership <laughs> failed on a massive level yeah. on all sides of politics on, on every level of government. It failed. Yeah. It and, was a real mess. <laughs> yeah, it really, it really was. And I remember that too, but the thing is, I think what they did so beautifully mixing the real news footage into the story yes. for us brings it home again that it's a real story because at first you think you're watching this massive disaster movie you're like oh this is huge and this is cool but and then it's and then you're like oh cr this is real this yeah. happens this right is very real this happened so like mixing that news footage it, it it reminds me that the news is about eyeballs and short uh short clips yeah so they're interested in action Right. Yeah. They're interested in the rain and the wind and the reporter standing out in it. And then, but once those, once the levees broke, the floodwaters rising was not that actiony, right? Like it was just slowly toxic water. Yeah. Right? Just like blue, 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 blue. Right. So then the news stories sort of turned to looting and turned to things that were action and exciting. And the truth is, is none of it touched what was going on inside these places. None of it yeah. touched the real experience of going through it. And we are going to see climate crises and collective crises like the pandemic continue to happen on a more frequent and ferocious level. We all need to pay attention to what this is. It's it because if you think it's not going to happen to you, it will. It doesn't matter where you live. I grew up in tornado country. Um, we're just having more and more, we're having more and more issues this way. And we need to figure out who we want to be together in these. Yes. Moments. And I think five days gives us all an opportunity to have that conversation. I really hope people watch it. It's so beautifully done. It is really aside, good. If I wasn't in it, I would be begging people. To watch it. <laughs> Speaking of tornado country, I grew up in Kansas, so I'm very, uh, yes. Um, okay. So better call Saul. This has ended. Obviously <laughs> we've had several cast members on. I'm curious to ask this. Uh, the other cast members I didn't ask cause I just got so excited to talk to them that it slipped <laughs> my mind. But when your characters were first introduced, the Kettleman's, did you follow the message boards at all and just realize how massive the fan base was and how people were trying to connect your characters with the Breaking Bad world? Because it was like insane when you guys first got introduced and, and your story sort of continued on throughout the seasons. And then obviously we know how it all ended. <laughs> so. Yeah. I don't know that I had. Uh, um, so there's a dark side of the internet for Betsy Kettleman. Uh, for, for Betsy <laughs> That's Kettleman an understatement. So I think um, I, my husband looked at me at one point and he was like, you should just stay off Reddit. So I, I did. So I don't think I had an awareness of um, just for my own sanity. Right. So I don't think I had an awareness of that kind of stuff. I mean, eventually people really started talking to me on Twitter 
Okay. Um, on social, <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you what did happen. I, I, the first thing that happened was we were originally hired for two episodes um, and we were there shooting the first one. And uh, I don't think any of us, in, I don't think anybody really knew what the Kettlemans were except a foil uh, with how, with Hamlin, Hamlin McGill at first. Yeah. And um, the exploration of those characters, we were there during prep um, because it was the first episode of the show and uh, Jeremy's a theater actor. We were rehearsing a lot together. And then Vince, we had extra time on set to actually explore the characters. And that just never happens on television ever because the schedule is very fast. So in this case, we had more time. And the more we all learned about the Kettleman's, uh, the more the, 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 that everybody got interested. And then the writers went back after that first episode and redid the boards, which I had never even heard of anyone doing on TV. And um so we wound up with a much larger storyline than we would have. But um, when we were shooting episode seven, or the, the final episode of season one that the Kettlemans appear in, uh, Deborah Birnbaum was working at Variety at the time, and she had come to Albuquerque to do a big profile on Bob Odenkirk and to talk to Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould about the new show. I think they, you know they were pre prepping to roll things out. And when they brought her for an on-set visit, we were shooting one of those scenes at Loyola, Loyola's Diner. Yeah. And um, Deborah, uh, uh, she really hooked on to the Kettleman's. And she asked to interview me that day. And I <laughs> I had not been prepped for it. And, you know, AMC is very secretive. The Breaking Bad world is very secretive. So someone from, uh, someone from AMC sat with me. Um, to make sure I didn't, you know, say anything that I wasn't supposed to say. And, and I did this interview with her and listening to her experience of watching us was made me go, oh, maybe we hit something here. Cause you know, the, the pocket for Betsy is very small, um, very narrow and anything outside of that is kind of just bad acting. So like it was, I wasn't sure, but when Vince Gilligan looks at you and says, yes, do that. You say, oh yes, sir. I would love to <laughs> like you, you know, so like it's. I, I I think it was scary to roll that out. Betsy was like jumping off a cliff for me. Um, and it was helpful that Bob and I had worked together for us to be sitting across from each other in those moments and go, okay. But I think Deborah, Deborah's attention to that moment, it was the first moment that I went, oh, I think something really special might, might be happening here. Because otherwise I'm working with Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould and the Breaking Bad team and all these amazing people. So I've just got my head down trying to like live up, right? Trying to do the work, trying to live up to the writing. So I think that was that was the first the first little moment. And then when everybody came on this and then and then AMC was like, you know, you might should go get a publicist. Like and that's how I met my, Mona Loring, my publicist. Oh, so, she's a she's amazing. She's, yeah, she's worked she, with her forever. So I think she's wonderful. But she really I had no idea how to navigate that. I wasn't expecting to. I was a recurring guest star. I wasn't you know, but it was it was the AMC publicity people that were like, we think you should maybe look for and Melissa Bernstein with a producer. She, they were like, yeah, we think maybe you should should look for somebody to help you navigate what we think is coming. And, uh, and yeah, well, I imagine because people probably start reaching out to you on social media, wanting to interview you. Yeah. And, and I'm very, I'm, I'm pretty responsive on social. So yeah. So, and I don't know how to handle it. I don't know. It, you yeah, know, it's, I it's say, I think I having a publicist is the best idea uh, for anybody in this industry because it helps control your world, which can be insane. Everybody please yeah. watch five days at Memorial. It's streaming on Apple TV plus. We have been chatting with the wonderful Julianne Emery about this, Better Call Saul, uh, Catch-22, Fargo. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time today. It's been a pleasure chatting and meeting you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.